All right, all right. Hey, you can grab your Bible and you can turn to the book of Matthew. Hope you brought your Bible with you. We're in the, as you can see, you're in a series uh, throughout, uh, gosh, the whole Easter season into the summer, actually, in the book of Matthew, talking about Jesus as king. And today on this day, Mother's Day, uh, it's a day filled with lots of joy, as we've noted, lots of celebration, but a lot of emotion, um, lots of change that takes place in our families. Uh, I noted earlier, you know, that um, to have a, have a child is to have your heart forever walking around outside your body, and that, even every little change that child goes through, it impacts you. Moms feel all the feels. I'm feeling it today. I hope you are. I praise God for my mom. I'll get to talk to her today. She might be listening to this sermon right now. In fact, um, she's my number one encourager. I get to live with an amazing mom. Stacy is an incredible mom to our, our kids. And some of you know, on a personal note, um, my daughter Whitney is about to give birth to our first grandson. So um, I was about to say she's about to become a mom. No, no she's, she is a mom. Um, and she's about to give birth to a baby. You talked to uh, Whitney, any of, these, any of these moms this morning? Uh, who were here dedicating their children. When, when, you, when you get pregnant, I'm no expert, but um, you, men can't have babies. Do we know this? Does anybody know this? Women have been given the gift to bring life into the world. But you talk about change, right? I've been watching like every day now. She's due a week from tomorrow. So I'm like, how are you doing? We good? You're good. How are you feeling? All right, good. I was able to see her this week because, I mean, so much change. Right? And with us, we had twins first time around. And so lots of change from the very start, right? From the inside out, things start to change. But here's what we know. Motherhood is a journey of constant change. Okay? So to just share the, the, you know, the obvious here, um, constant change. And, and for a lot of us, we're going we're to talk about change today. Um, for all of us. Message for everybody here. But uh, moms know this as well or better than any of us. Uh, a lot of us, like me, you might say, you know, hey, I love change. Like I would say, no, I like change. I'm one of those that like change. But you know what, what we really mean? Get underneath that. You know what I really mean? I like change I can control. Right? If we can't control the change, that's trouble. And we all even fear that kind of change. We play out scenarios in our minds when something goes wrong. I'm praying for several of our members right now, you know, going, going through tests or those who have cancer, walking through this or that, or a baby coming. And if we're not careful, we play out stories. We sang about it earlier. Just focus on the present. He's the God of the present. He is, yes, the God of the future. But we don't, we're not in the future. And we're not in the past. But we're in the midst of change. I want you to think today about change that's taking place in your life right now. This is how you always teaching towards application. I want you to think about some change that you're walking through, okay? So set that in your mind. I'll kind of prompt it along the way, but be thinking about that. Major change, maybe, for some of you, and you're really, maybe you're struggling through change. And here's what happens. All change, um, all change it, it also has, has grief that comes along with it because you're losing something, right? That's, in essence, the definition of change. So I want to ask you, how are you doing? How are you doing with the change that you're seeing in your life? Uh, because a lot of us are, are going through change. Like next week, we're going to celebrate our seniors, our graduates. You talk about all the feels. There's a lot of emotion in families where the graduate is about to leave the family, perhaps. I mean, leave the, leave, leave, you know, go off to school. We've got seniors graduate. We've got single adults who are walking through a lot of change. Our young adults, our whole world you know, is constantly changing around us. It's the only constant, right? And, and so how are you doing with change? And, and don't you wish that you can manage change in your life a little better? And maybe there's a better question than that. There's a much better question. How can we flourish through seasons of change? Yes, when change comes to us that we did not ask for, and that will happen. It'll happen today, right? It'll happen this week. It always happens. So life is changed, not just motherhood. Life is constantly changing. So the key, the key question for disciples of Jesus, if you're in, with me in that group, is how can I flourish? How can Christ be formed in me as I walk through the changes that are bound to come in my life? That's what I want us to look at today. And we're going to be in Matthew 9. You can turn to Matthew 9. We're going to see a passage of scripture here that, um, that we have chosen for today. It's not a Mother's Day 
sermon per se, but it's going to speak to every mom here. It's going to speak to every one of us. And what we're going to find here in Matthew 9 is, is when we walk through seasons of change, if you take notes, here it is. Kind of unpack it this way. We've got to ask the right questions, first of all. We've got to allow for God's timing. Anybody? That, we always struggle with that. And then in the end, we've got to adopt. We've got to accept the gifts that he gives to us. Accept what God gives us. And we're going to talk in the context of the most major shift change that the world has ever known. That's the context of this thing we talked about last week. Jesus is the king bringing a new kingdom, and it is the kingdom of grace, kingdom of faith, not works. It's grace, not the law. And so this is the context we find ourselves in. Jesus is, is teaching here in Matthew 9. He's going he's gonna to tell us how we can have a healthy response to change. We've got we to have a healthy response. Change requires the right questions, requires the, the right timing, and it requires the right response. Now, in this passage in Matthew 9, uh, he's called Matthew, who's the writer, the, the gospel writer. He's called Matthew to be a disciple. And uh, so Matthew throws a party with all of his friends. And this is what's cool. I've seen this. New believers reach unbelievers better than a lot of us because we start to hunker down and, and kind of hide out uh, from, from our unbelieving friends, perhaps. And instead, Matthew says, let's go. And he's one of the tax collectors and sinners, right? And Jesus then, as a rabbi, any righteous person would not be with this group of people. That was like a, a category that just dissed a complete group of people. Like nobody hangs out with them. Jesus does because he says to them, here's the response to their allegations. And of course, he wore that like a badge. You bet I am a friend of tax collectors, sinners, all right? I'm here for the outsider, not the insider. I'm not here to coddle insiders. I'm here for the outsider. This is a good word for all of us as a church family. Look at verse 12. But when he heard it, okay, their allegations, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician but those who are sick. Now, here's what he's saying. And I mean, wait, scripture, interpret scripture. Uh, those who think they're well don't need me. Those who know they are sick, that's who I've come for. This crew knows they're sick. These guys are ostracized. These gals don't fit in. They know, so I'm here for them. Verse, th verse 13, go and learn what this means. This is, how about that? He pauses. Hey, would you go think deeply about this? Pause for a moment. Go and think about this. I mean, I'll do this often, right? Y'all think deeply about this. Apply this. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. He quotes Hosea 6.6, 6, which goes on to say, hey, you need to know the heart of God, not just follow the law. You need to get to the heart of the law, which we talked about last week a bit. Um, and the word sacrifice he uses here sums up all the religious practices in the law, okay? The, the, the Torah and the law of Moses, the Old Testament way of coming before God. We often throw the Pharisees under the bus all the time, like, oh, they're messed up, they're evil. But in fact, that's all they knew. And in our world today, I've gone to places they've never heard the gospel. And every religion is some form of us trying to think our way, work our way to God. What else do we have? Instead, in Christianity, it's God coming to us in Christ. And, and we all hear this often. It's not religion, but a relationship now with him. And Jesus is saying, I've come not, not for the law, not, not to beat everybody down, not the way of shame. Instead, I want you to think about mercy, okay, grace, and not the law, not uh, self-righteousness, but a righteousness that he's going to bring to us. Now, look at verse 14, because we're going to put ourselves in position, okay? If we, I, I don't think I've ever thought about this. Today, we kind of put ourselves in uh, in a group with a group of people that we don't often identify with in scripture. Now, when you read scripture, you always kind of do that. Like, oh yeah, that's me. Like, oh, that's me. Oh, darn, I'm that person. But here, we're going to identify with the disciples of John who are asking this question. You know that John the Baptist, we, we introduced him, the baptizer, earlier on in Matthew, the new Elijah before the Messiah. And it says, then the disciples of John came to him saying, why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? So they're asking this question. Now, Mark's version has them asking the question as well. But in Luke 5, it says the Pharisees are asking this question. But here's what's happening. 
John the Baptist's disciples are much like the Pharisees. Commentators would note, and I think what's happening here, they're all together. They're in this together. Why, why, is he not, why are they not fasting like us? Because they had moved fasting beyond what the law required. It became a religious practice. Like if you're going to be really religious, you do these things. And they'd gone beyond it and even beyond the heart of the law itself. And Jesus is going to answer their question. The first thing I want you to see, though, is they're asking the wrong question. During times of change, you're thinking about what you're going through right now. Season of change, what you're wrestling with, maybe some anxiety in your life and worry because of change in your life. You've got to ask the right questions. That's the first thing I want you to see here. They make two mistakes with this question. The first one is they're asking why. Now, you might say, why is a legit question? But think about this. In terms of change and as disciples of Jesus, why is really a question of resistance. Why is not a real helpful question. You know what a better question is? How? Even that one, like, wait, how? How is this going to happen? Consider Mary, the ultimate mom in the Bible. And she is not simply because she gave birth to the Messiah, but in Luke, early on in Luke, she's told that she's going to be given birth to the, to the Savior. And you know, what her, you know what her response is? Not, wait, why? I mean, she could have, I guess. Why me? You know, remember her question? Her question is how? How is this going to happen? And then she says immediately, I am your servant. Let it be so. I don't know how. But I know who. I know who's speaking to me here. So listen, better than why, better than how is the question who. Now, the great example of this is, of course, Job in the Old Testament. The whole story is about why, why he's asking why. All his friends are asking why. And Job doesn't get his answers. He doesn't, which makes us crazy reading, reading the story. Why doesn't he? Because it's the wrong question. He starts to shift in the story, though. He starts to shift to who? In fact, God turns <laughs> the tables on him. He does this to us, doesn't he? He starts to ask him the questions. Let God ask you the questions. Who is in charge of your life? Who is sovereign over your life in this season of change? Who sees the future that you do not see? Who is guiding you every step of the way? Who created you? He comes at Job. Who's your daddy? I am your daddy. I will lead your life. I'm in control. No, it doesn't make sense. You can keep asking why. It was, I think it was Dietrich Bonhoeffer who said, you keep asking questions, it eliminates the need for commitment. That's what a lot of us do. Can't figure this out. Well, God, until all the ducks in a row, I'll, I mean, you know, I'll, I'll figure this out. How am I going to do this financially? You're calling me to do I'm, I'm wait. Okay, I'm waiting on this. And God said, who, who's got you? Who, who's got you? You see, who is, the, is really the question of faith? And it, and it draws us to him. How is a good question. How points us to the Bible? How does God do this thing? But it also points us when we say, who is in charge of my life? The second reason this question is off is because it's a question of comparison. We make the same mistake. You hear them? Why do they do that and we don't do this? How come we're over here, you know, kicking it with the law? They're not even fasting. Like, what's going on? It's a question of comparison. And listen, here's what we do. Walking through season of change. You're going through it right now. We tend to compare with others. Why am I losing my job right now? How come I am not married yet? Why am I going through this struggle? And can I say it tender, but why am I not a mom? I want to be a mom. And listen, moms do this. We all do it. But mom, let me challenge you today. Love you. Stop comparing yourself to others. Comparison is the thief of joy. Grandmothers do this. When my grandbaby going to have a grandbaby? When is my baby going to have a grandbaby? When are we going to do this? Okay, so no, stop. Stop asking all the questions because what happens is comparison robs us of what God is doing uniquely in our lives. When we're looking at everybody else, we compare our children with their children. And, and can I just say it right now? There are no super moms. You're like, no, that mom is legit. She's amazing. She got her act together. No, you're looking at her on Instagram. 
She's, pulling, she's just putting out with the best stuff. She's not showing, showing you crying in her closet when things are, I mean, a mound of laundry and things are out of control and her kids are making her crazy. Listen, comparison is a thief of joy. God says, I've got something for you, and it's not their story. He's writing the story, as we sung earlier. I, I love, there's a story in John chapter 21, one of my favorite, you don't need to turn there, one of my favorite passages in all scripture. And it's the reinstatement of Peter as a disciple after he uh, denies Jesus. You might know the story. And in that story, Peter says, I mean, Jesus says, Peter, get back in the game, in essence. Like, come on. Yes, you've blown it. But I'm writing a new story. This story is going to continue. I've invested a crucifixion in you. I've invested a resurrection in you. Don't give up. And he's saying that to you today. But then Peter, he he tells Peter, and by the way, things are going to get rough. I mean, follow me doesn't mean there's like all roses and, you know, pansies and and butterflies and rainbows. It means that ultimately you're going to die a martyr's death. This is what's going to happen. And then Peter, you know what what his response is? You remember this? Like he sees John, the beloved disciple, like walking or nearby. He goes, hey, what about him? What about him? Like, is he going to share my fate? What about him? And then Jesus responds with this. Look at this, verse 22. Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, like I, I just keep him here forever and he's not, nothing's going to happen to him, what is that to you? Follow me. You follow me. Now, I say that a certain way. I think it's loving the way he says it. What is that to you, Peter? You follow me. See, don't worry about somebody else's story. Don't compare your job to somebody else's job. Don't compare your your salary, your house, your thing, your clothes with somebody else's. It will rob you of joy and it will suck you dry of any kind of purpose in life and you will shrivel up and die over time. Stop comparing yourself to others. It just leads to condemnation and shame. And so here's here's what I want you to apply. Some have called this uh, the witty principle. Okay, W-I-T-T-Y. This you can apply this week. What is that to you is the question. Because what we do, this is so destructive. We just keep on comparing ourselves to everybody else. And this week, when that kicks in with you, be mindful, watch for it, because you need to say, you need to hear the word of the Lord come to you saying, hey, no, 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 you follow me. I have a unique story for you. I've created you uniquely. I'm guiding your story to bring glory to me. Comparison keeps us from seeing what God is doing uniquely in us. And it robs so many of us of our joy. See, the problem with most of us is we're struggling with change. And the new thing that God wants to bring out of this change, because we're stuck in the past. And we will not change. And God's doing a new thing. And for many of us, the greatest barrier in your life, keeping you from experiencing God's new thing, is the old thing. The thing that you will not let go of. And and we could apply this even, even corporately as a church. Never been done that way in the church before is the big hurdle, right? And those things, watch this, those things become idols. That's how I get close to God. No, you know, they're like gods to you. If you go to anything that can't fulfill your heart and your mind and, and your, your, your life that is, that, that is not God, you go to something that's not him, pursuing that, seeking that thing, and you say, that's become core for me, that's an idol. And God is saying, okay, let's, rem- let's keep, 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 keep nimble. Watch, here's where this story goes. See, instead of comparing why doesn't my story look like their story, remember the who question. Who is in control of my life is the question. And Jesus is going to tell us what's going on here because here's what he does. After they ask all the questions and and comparing and whatever else, not only do you need to ask the right question, but here's the second thing. Look at this. Allow for God's timing. When it comes to change, timing is what throws us all the time. God sees the big picture moving forward. Jesus' answer here, look at this, is, is essentially the timing's not right. The timing's not right. Look at verse 15. And Jesus said to them, can the wedding guests, watch this. He draws from two analogies, cultural analogies that all of them would have known better than us in the context. Weddings and funerals. Watch this. Can the wedding guest 
mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? And by the way, a wedding would be a feast like for days. Like you thought your, your wedding was awesome with your venue and all the or DJ or whatever else you had going. They would go for days. Jesus says, hey, it's a time of celebration. The bridegroom is here. He's here. He's, and I am the bridegroom. Look at this. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away. He's going to be taken away, put on a cross, his ascension. He said, then they will fast. There's time to fast. There's a time for fasting. And part of fasting, as it is even today, is a time of mourning. Fasting draws us close to God as we seek decisions. Fasting gets us to focus on him. Remember that he's enough for us. But think about that change that you're facing right now. It's some aspect of timing that is making you crazy, and it's a function of trust. Trusting the Lord. And for some of us, uh, if I could say this, um, again, tender for a lot of us here. If you, if you have a desire to be a mom, I'm praying for, for couples in our church right now who are walking through um, IVF or who are seeking to have children, praying for couples in our church right now. And if you're one of those, I want to apply this to everybody. There's a, there's a, there's a passage, you, you ought to go to Isaiah 54. Read that today because there's a woman who can't have children and it says what the Lord speaks into her life. And what he does, he says, listen, your offspring are being greater than, than the woman who, who can have children. See, some, watch this. God has planted that in your heart. To want to be a spiritual mother or father. God's planted that in your heart. Like the Jodries. You, did you, listen, I was at the Jodries this past week. Incredible what's happening there. The video didn't even catch half of what's going on. Lives are being changed. Students are connecting with each other. The honesty, the vulnerability that takes place in that home as our students lead out in Bible study is incredible. We need to multiply that by about 100 people. You can be a part of that. You can be a spiritual mother or father over the next generation. Because here's the thing. The Jodry's place, that's not a house. That's a vineyard. That is a vineyard where lives are being changed, where new wine is being poured in to their lives. And what we're going to see here in a moment, not only do we ask the right questions, we've got to allow for God's timing because many of us are not trusting the Lord because he's saying to you, the timing's not right. Trust me. Trust me. The timing is not right, but it's always time to obey the Lord. It's always time. And that's what I think he wants us to see. And so look, the last thing I want you to see here, we've got to ask the right question. We've got to allow for God's timing, but we've got to adopt what God gives you. You've got to adopt what God gives you in the midst of change because you're moving to something. Some of you have been given something you don't want. That's the kind of change we don't like. Look at how Jesus responds. This is a passage you might know, or this part of it, verse 16. No one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment for the patch tears away from the garment and the, and the, and the worse, a worse tear is made. So we, we all can grasp this, right? You've probably heard this before. Like you put uh, new, new jeans or new clothes in a dryer, shrink up. If those things are attached to already shrunk material, it starts tearing away. The very thing that you want to fix is now getting worse. Doesn't fix it. And back in the day, um, it was very important that uh, you, didn't, you couldn't just go buy a new container. Like, let's go buy a new cloth or this or that. It's a very time-consuming thing, and it costs a lot of money. And so they would just fix. They would try to fix what they already had. So everybody's tracking with him here. And then he says, hey, neither is new wine put into old wine skins. He's making a point with a different parable here, a different analogy. If it is, the skins burst, and the wine is spilled, and the skins are destroyed. But new wine is put into fresh wine skins. And then he says both are preserved. The, he's talking about the law and grace. He's talking about his way is the new way, the new wine, okay, bringing this new kingdom. And he's saying the old, the, the law, the way of self-righteousness is the only way that we know apart from grace. He says that is going to be put aside. No longer is that the way that we're going to ever try to get to God because you could never get there anyway. The law has proven that to us. It became a pedagogos, became a tutor to show us you can't be good enough. And so now Jesus comes and he says, my way is fresh and it is new. And I'm not here to patch up things. 
I'm here to change everything. I'm here to change your life from the inside out. Jesus did not come to repair the old garment and put it with the new. He's doing a new thing altogether, and the new thing is the new covenant. And this is where we're struggling. We are now John the Baptist's disciples. Wait, we haven't heard this. Hold on. Listen, if you don't become one of Jesus' disciples, like any of his disciples, if you don't make the shift, you will remain, you'll become a, a Judaizer or you will become a Pharisee altogether and never experience the grace of God and freedom that comes. A life asking all the wrong questions, a life of comparison, a life of works, trying to get to God somehow by your good works. Instead, Jesus comes and he says, I've got a brand new way. I'm not here to patch it up. I'm here to change it all together. Some of y'all might remember, uh, this hit me this week. Andrew, one of Jesus' disciples, Simon Peter's brother, Andrew was a disciple of John the Baptist. He was in this group. He must have been an early adopter because he, he's like, okay, that's awesome. You're pointing us to Jesus, so that's where I'm, I'm gone. I'm out. Okay, he becomes, and he brings his brother. We found him, and we do the same. We've got to move, friends, from, from this life that is, is kind of two feet in one place. When you come to Christ, you, you can't say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue in the law, try to be good enough to achieve something. We want to bring something to the table, right? Something measurable. I want to do my part, which is all about self-righteousness. I want to check the box. Jesus says, no, can't do it. If you're going to go that way, it will tear you apart. Some of us are living that way. See, a lot of us would say, because you hear it all the time, we're saved by faith, okay? We're saved by grace through faith, we would say. Not by the law or through works. And we would all go, Get it, I get it. No, but some of y'all, this might be new for you today. But that's the Christian message. That's what it's all about. So we say, I'm, we're saved by grace. I get it, I get it. But listen, many of us live as if we don't believe that we're saved by grace alone. I want to bring a little something to the table. And again, self-righteousness comes into play. And Jesus says, you can't have your feet in both worlds. You, you got to take off the old and you got to put on the new. And so we've got to give our hearts and lives to him. He changes our patterns. He changes everything about us. We're saved by grace. And, and, and it's his grace that's come to us. He, he died on the cross for your sin. He, he poured out his blood, which then becomes the new wine that fills us up. That's why we even partake of the Lord's Supper. It's a way of saying, your life in me now. Your life in me. I will not live this way anymore. I give you my life. It's like what Paul says in Galatians 3, 2, 2 and 3. He says this, let me ask you this only. Here's my question for you today. Paul is asking us, did you receive the spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? He's saying, are you trying to let Moses finish what Jesus has begun in your life? No. And here's, here's what this means. Constantly go back to grace. Grace becomes the only valid motivation and animation to my obedience. Not because I love him. He first loved me. All of life is a response to what Christ has done. He took your sin upon the cross. And so that you can be set free. The shame is gone. Your past is gone. And you can now move into every change knowing who you are. I am his. He has defined me. And watch this. I don't need to compare myself to anybody else in the world. Because he's already defined who I am. And he has a story for me that he's writing. And this is a good day to remind all of our moms and everybody here of this. Rules without relationship breed rebellion in a child. We say this periodically, but here's what happens. God, he's the one who's come to us. We have a relationship with him. And, and, and what happens is we want to love him as he loves us. And that comes out in a, a life of obedience. Friends, we, we often, what we do, if we're not living in grace, we start to really put that on everybody else around us. And parents, let me just tell you, if you're not, if you're not, not parenting by grace, and I'm not trying to shame anybody, I'm just saying, and I say this to dads all the time, rules without relationship breed rebellion. The Father Day's message I have every year is to moms as well, be there, be there, be attentive, be aware, be there for them. And then you have uh, an opportunity to speak. You have authority, spiritual authority to speak. 
and to speak truth to them. That's how God leads us. That's how he guides us along the way in our relationships with him. And so, so, so as, as we close, I, I want you to know this. I want you to think about, again, that change in your life, some area, maybe now for a moment of confession as we come to land this. In some area of your life, you are inflexible. You, you're hardened. You're set in your ways. A lot of times we turn to older folks, right? Senior adults. Yeah, they have a hard time. Ch- no. Nope. Yes, and yet that's all of us. In what area of your life are you inflexible? You're like the old wineskins. You will not budge. It could be an addiction. It could be a habit, habitual sin. It could be a relationship that you've not given over to the Lord. What, what is it for you? Because I've got good news for you today. And that's all of us in varying degrees, some area of our lives. The wine that breaks the wineskin is the blood of Christ. The thing that comes at us where we're trying to resist all the things that come at us, the way that we can come against sin and live the life he's called us to is to receive his grace and let his spirit live in us. It's not by keeping the rules. Gang, listen, the Christian life is so much better than keeping all the rules. It's a heart motivated out of love. Paul says it's faith working itself out in love. That's the Christian life. Faith in the one who's already defined me. All the love I need, I found in him. I can love you without any need for love in return. I don't compare myself to anybody, I'm saying on my best days, um, because Christ has already defined me. He's got my story. He's got your story. And he wants you to live it out today. And so I'll close with this passage. It's in Romans 8. This is a word for all of us. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And listen, moms, Please, and all of us, self-condemnation has got to end in your life. And it happens as you turn to the gospel of grace. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. And so here it is. Jesus says that he has come to to keep both. How do you keep the law? Like Jeff, I thought you were saying we don't have the law and grace. That doesn't work together. You can't patch it up together. He's saying, watch this. God's inflexible holiness and our sin collide on the cross and redemption is made possible for you because of Jesus. Praise be to God. Amen. He's made a way. So now I want us to pray. Would you just bow your head and close your eyes with me? And I'm going to pray as we we close our time. And I want to ask you, friends, this is the most important moment of the day. Uh, We know we're probably heading to lunch or whatever else we might be doing today. Go make some flowers, a bouquet. But this is the moment. How is God calling you to respond right now? Some of you need to receive his grace today. You're just in this life trying to be good enough, comparing yourself to everybody else. That's that's the way it leads, asking all the wrong questions. And you've been confronted with who it is who changes your life, who brings grace and forgiveness because he was your substitute on the cross. You're set free from your sin. There's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Give your life to him right now. By faith, say, Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my life. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Now make me the person you've called me to be. And bring for you that that thing that you identified, the change that you're going through. What is he calling you to do today? Lord, may we ask all the right questions. May we allow for your timing, trust you, and adopt whatever you give us as our story to glorify you. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.